Joy Martin. Hello, everybody. I am Anita Jefferson. And hi, everyone. I'm Terry Roberts. Uh, I'm the Executive Director of Intentional Faith, and we make up the uh, spiritual development team at Intentional Faith, and we're just uh, really excited about being back with you today and uh, sharing God's Word. And, you know, we've been in a study of uh, the Sermon on the Mount, and we went through the Beatitudes, and last week talk, talked about being uh, salt of the earth and light into the world. And today we're going to focus on Matthew 5, verses 17 through 20, where Jesus tells us that he came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And uh, just was thinking this morning about that transition of law that was written on stone tablets that now Jesus has come so that that word can be and that truth can be written on our hearts. So we're going to explore that today. But before we get into the word, let's bow for a word of prayer. And Lord, again, we just... Uh, give you praise for everything you do. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the gift of your son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank you for these precious words that we'll be studying today that Jesus shared in uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And Father, help us to understand clearly as he came to fulfill the law, that was for us, Lord, that, that we could write that law on our hearts. We could live in that truth. We could be his righteousness, Father. And we, we thank you for how you speak to us through your word. And we pray that you do that today. And Father, that you bless everyone who hears this video, that you would just touch their lives and, and just speak truth into them. And Father, we just pray all this now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Joy, would you uh, read scripture for us? Absolutely. All right, we're uh, today we're in Matthew chapter 5 still, and we're in verses 17 through 20, if you want to follow along with us, but I'll read it to us, and um, as we listen to see what Jesus has to say. So starting in verse 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow, what does he mean by that? All right, Terry. That's right. <laughs> well, I always love hearing the word of God uh, spoken out loud. And, and so, you know, the focus of these words are on the law. And, of course, we want to make sure we all clearly understand the law that we're talking about here. Of course, this is the law of Moses, the Old Testament law. Um, and, you know, it's interesting in, in context of, you know, now Jesus is here on when, when he's doing this Sermon on the Mount, but the whole, the whole message of the Old Testament, both the law and the prophets, was really in preparation of the Messiah coming, of Jesus coming. And so now he's here on earth in this scripture, and He's actually quite different than what uh, most of the uh, followers of the law had ex expected or what they were anticipating him to be. So, um, so Jesus is trying to emphasize to them here, you know, that he is, he's not going to abolish this old Testament law because it's a sacred thing and, and it's all true and none of that's going to change. And, uh, but he's going to fulfill that law. And um, so you know, some qu one question that popped in my mind first, and I'm going to throw it to Miss Anita to, to try to answer for us, is why do you think Jesus' followers, those who were listening to him speak this, thought that maybe he had come to abolish that Old Testament law? Oh, my goodness. What do you think about that? Oh, my, oh my goodness. Uh, I'm glad you said I would try. Uh, <laughs> however, That's all we can do. Uh, 
that's all I can do. I, I did not get an answer out of a textbook. I couldn't find an answer on Google, and I didn't find a scriptural answer. So I just got to figure out, you know, what, what I think. What, what on earth were they thinking? Uh, they they uh, thought that he came to abolish the law. Um, I asked my sister, I threw the question out in the car. Um, as you can see, I'm not at home. I'm kind of like discombobulated right now, but that's all right. I'm not sitting at my dining room table. So I threw that question out to them as we were riding. And one of my sisters said, well, first of all, they thought that the king, they thought that they were going to get a person that was going to uh, free them, like in war, rather than, they did not know that Jesus, the righteous person, was to come. So in a sense, that may be part of the reason why the disciples um, uh, ask him that question. Uh, let me see. Uh, Terry, let me look at my question again. You said, your, your question was, uh, why was his listeners uh, have thought that he had come to abolish the law? I think, I tell you personally, I think that they wanted the law to, uh, uh, no, they did not want the law to be abolished because that's how they live. They live their lives according to the law. And then the law in the Old Testament is referred to as the scriptures. The law was given to us from the scriptures, from Moses and the prophets as well. So they wanted to live by the law. Jesus had just got through talking to them about righteousness and what real uh, salvation was all about. And you are blessed if you're this and you're blessed if you're that. So I don't think that they were so much concerned with righteousness as they were with the law. They wanted to abide. They wanted it to be abolished. They, they did not want the law to be abolished because it was easy for them to live according to the law. So, uh, and the reason why I think because that's probably if Jesus came to us today, and uh, we would probably think the same thing. So um, I'm thinking that that's one of the reasons why, or I think that that's, that might be one of the reasons why is because please don't abolish the law. We're not ready to be righteous. We're not ready to, to live according to the heart, how Jesus is going to change the hearts of man. That's not what we want to do. We want to live according to the letter. Or we want to live according to what's in our minds, not what's in our hearts. So on that thought, I am going to give it up to Joy. Joy, there's a question here if I could read it. Uh, so <laughs> I need the keys, Nina. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So Joy, I can, your question just left my screen. So you know what it is, right? Well, I know what it is. Well, thank you so much, Anita, for everything. I know, and for you guys watching, Anita is, is being with her sister who is, has gone through cancer um, and treatments, and now they're having a follow-up visit. So she is um, being the good sister and helping her um, move out with that and move on with that, I should say. So thank you for joining us in all your places there, Anita. We love having you with us um anyway the question is how are we sometimes guilty in the church of following only the letter of the law and um and i just have to say um this is a fun question for me <laughs> that's that's why i gave it to you by that's the way why you gave it to me it I is a you get that. question for me so um I think, I, let me start by saying I myself have been guilty, so I'm not going to preach at anybody. I'm preaching to myself as well. I think it's so easy for us to make up our own measurement of what is right and what is wrong, because if we make our own up, we can always reach it. And Anita was talking about, um, you know, the law and and they thought that maybe Jesus um, had come to abolish the law well the, the problem is 
Jesus had given the law to them in the Old Testament, but different men along the way, uh, you know, added their little uh, extra little part to it um, because it was easy for them to control the people and to control what was going on. And it was easier to say, check, check, check. I did this, this, and this. And you know, checklists always make us feel better. If I got a checklist and I can check it off, I'm going, good, I'm done, you know. Um, and so, but what happened here is the law and the, and the, the things, the man-made extras that came with it, um, it really became more and more self-focused and self-made. And so anytime there is, is self-involved, self becomes the center, then you're, you're not looking at God, because here's the deal. We can't make up our own uh, enough righteousness on our own, but the law, people would add to it or create their own and say, you know, if we can, um, we can do this, but then that's not true righteousness because the only true righteousness is the one from the Father, which we can't do on our own anyway. We can never reach it. So, um, but a lot of ways the church, and I say myself included in, in the past, have done this, and still sometimes I have twinges, um, is use formulas for everything. Formula for salvation prayers. If you pray this prayer, honey, you're going to heaven. If you say these words, boy, if you miss a word, then you're going to miss out. You know, or prayers in general, you know, it's got to come with some acrostic, you know, this, 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 <laughs> this. Um, and if you don't get that acrostic right, then mercy, your prayers are only hitting the ceiling. Uh, proper dress, certain kind of dress. Um, tithing. We always want to just get by, you know, it's like, so we look in the Bible and we see this 10% thing. Um, and we say, okay, that's the, but in reality, in the law, the 10% was the minimum. Actually, there were offerings added onto that to where it comes up to like 20 something percent of your income and not 10 percent but everybody read that 10 percent and said what what is the minimum we have to do to say check check so it's always making ourselves rationalizing our own um behavior almost um, and like I said, control um, and being able to do something in our own strength um, that's that's where we kind of got off the rails there. But what Jesus said, and back to the question, um, or back to going back into this story, um, bringing it back to the heart and righteousness, you know, Jesus, well, he just, he just spoke right into it. And he used one of the prophets in, in Amos. And I, I got to read this. He said, uh, in Amos chapter five, you know, God says, I absolutely despise your festivals. I get no pleasure from your religious assemblies. Even if you offer me burnt and grain offerings, I will not be satisfied. I will not look with favor on your peace offerings or fattened calves. Take away from me your noisy songs. I don't even want to hear your music or your stringed instruments. Justice must flow like water. Right actions like a stream that never dries up. And then Jesus says something very interesting for today, especially with all of our uh, quarantine and COVID issues and how it has changed the face of gathering in church. Malachi 1.10, this, this just blew me away. It says, God says, I wish that one of you would close the temple doors so that you no longer would light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Sovereign Lord, and I will no longer accept an offering from you. Mm. So, I mean, that's some powerful stuff that uh, God is saying here. And what he really longed for was for us to love him from our heart because we, well, to obey him from our heart because we loved him. Be out of love for him, you know, in the beginning, when you have a little kid, you teach them. You, know, you make them say all the time, say thank you, say please, say thank you. Well, you say that to them constantly, constantly. And that's kind of the law you're giving them as a child. But then 
because but you're hoping that when they turn 10 and 15 and 20 you're not still going around behind them saying say please say thank you say please say thank you you're hoping that by doing that as a child that you've ingrained in them a heart of kindness and mm -hmm. gratitude and thankfulness and so this is what um my husband said one time it's like the law for so it was kind of like our kindergarten experience. It said here, do this, do this, do this. But the point that God was making was, I'm giving you the law, but I want it to get into your heart so much that pretty soon you do it just, you just have that heart of the law and you understand it based on my love for you and your love for me and that we walk together like that, not out of obligation. Anyway, that's my big, my big sermon for the day. But Terry, um, explain more about what Jesus means when he says that our righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees. So I touched on we never can be good enough on our own, but, but explain that, Mr. Theologian. <laughs> well, that was a, you, you, you led right into some of my thoughts about that for sure, because, you know, we know that the Pharisees were like these really strict followers of the law and the problem in that for them was that they believed that that was all that was required of them to enter the kingdom of heaven they thought just like joy was saying they thought they check these boxes they do the sacrifices at the right time they don't do any work and do what on the sabbath day they observe all of the the law of moses and that was all they needed to do. Um, but the issue in that for me, as I was thinking through it, and Joy kind of touched on this a little bit too, that put all the focus on themselves. That, that it was their good works. It was their merit. It was their righteousness. And I, I went to some scripture in the New Testament um, in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And it's all very familiar scripture to us. And this is not by your own doing. It's a gift of God. It's not a result of your works so that no man may boast. And typically when I thought of the Pharisees, and sadly some Christians today come across as very prideful, boastful sort of people because they think that they are doing what is required, this strict adherence to the law or to the rules that uh, is going to win their way into heaven. And I hope we all realize that that's not what gets us there. It is strictly the grace of God and through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so the righteousness that Jesus is talking about here, how we exceed that sort of fairly shallow righteousness of the, of the Pharisees is we've got to receive his righteousness. You know, Jesus not only came to save us, he came to redeem us also. Um, just read in some, um, some commentary, it says, in, in fulfilling the law and prophets, Jesus was not merely setting an example for us to follow. The will of God is for us to receive and participate in his righteousness, in Jesus' righteousness. And uh, it kind of took me to 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says, for our sake, he, God, made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So Jesus was without sin. He became sin because of all the sin we committed. He died on a cross. His blood was shed for us so that we could be that righteousness. So it could never be about us following rules, us checking boxes, us going to church every Sunday or being baptized a certain way or taking communion a certain number of times a month. It is just about believing that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And that is where our righteousness comes from. Only through the blood of Jesus are we made righteous. And the only way we can walk in that righteousness is through the power of the Holy Spirit now and how it speaks to us through his word. So, uh, yeah, I just, um, I'd be very excited about this scripture today. And I'll ask you ladies, any other thoughts before we, uh, 
before we close. Oh, I've preached my sermon. <laughs> all right. Well, good I, I, I was trying to think of any, but uh, you all have covered it so well. I definitely don't have any other thoughts other than what's already been mentioned. I was looking at uh, my notes. I finally found them. They had fell on the floor. I covered well. Covered well. Just another wow moment. <laughs> well, this is, this is powerful scripture, and so... Oftentimes we don't we yes, we think about it kind of at a surface level, I, or I do. I'm very guilty of that, or I have been in the past. That okay, Jesus, yeah, he was. All this was foretold in in the Old Testament, and now Jesus is here, and so the fulfillment of all that was said in the Old Testament is here. But he's taking it another step further of that, writing it now on our hearts, so that we are living in the truth of his righteousness and the truth of what the old Testament law and prophets had foretold. And, and those laws that this scripture says, none of that's going to change. None of it ever, ever has, or ever will change. Jesus is just, just coming to fulfill that oh, so yeah. that we have that within our own selves. And I'm Absolutely. for the verse that says, I'll take away your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I never ever thought about that before thinking the Ten Commandments like were on stone. Written on stone. That written on stone and now but the flesh, here's God coming the flesh in Jesus Christ. Whew, I never had I never had made that connection in that verse. Um the heart of stone taking away the heart of stone and giving you the heart of flesh. <laughs> that was good. Thank you. Great to have light bulb moments when you're studying the word. That's good. That's good. Well, all right. Well, I hope uh, hope everyone was was blessed and and gained something uh, from from our study of the word today. And uh, Miss Anita, are you okay to close us in prayer? You're muted, sweetie. I, I am perfectly okay to close in prayer. I just hope I don't freeze up. Um, Go for it. All is well and all has been well and we expect all to be well in Jesus because of who he is. And on that note, we're close. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. God, we love you. We thank you. We magnify your name. We thank you for who you are right now. We thank you because you're God. You are our creator. You are the you love your whole entire creation. And we thank you, God. We want to give you glory for this very moment. But you have allowed us to come together and do what we do, do what you have purposes to do. And that's to expound on your word. And to those who's listening, those who's tuned in, Father, we pray your blessing over your people because we are yet your people. We're still called by your name. Father, now help us and to keep us and direct us as we move through the rest of the day, it is in you that we live, we move, and we do have our beings. Now, God, we ask that you will embrace us and protect us as we leave this place and go on to the next journey. Uh, from traffic light to traffic light, breathe on us and help us and protect us. From room to room, Father, bless your people. These blessings we do ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hope you all were blessed and uh, we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.